Let me tell a story because my art comes from me being a little child and not being able to speak. I had a very bad speech impediment and I couldn't, I couldn't talk to anybody. The, the sounds wouldn't come out right. My need for communication was intense. <laughs> and so when my mother was making pottery, I would take the clay and I started making these figures that were basically me trying to show how I felt. And then I would show the little figurine to my mother and that's how she would know how I felt because I couldn't explain it in words to her. So I found out really early I could communicate things through sculpting. So it wasn't like I'm making art, I'm going to make a drawing, or I'm, it's, it was pure communication. I loved my clay that I buy from a box. And it saves me a lot of time processing it. I think it's important to experience digging clay and mixing your own clay. And I grew up doing that because my mother used to dig her own clay. I've dug a lot of clay and mixed a lot of clay. I'm glad because I can find clay, I can mix clay, I can get it so that it'll work. But um, at this point, I'm not so concerned with going, oh, my clay was traditionally dug and da-da-da-da-da, because um, to me, clay, no matter where it, it's from, it's from the earth. And so clay is all special. I like to make a mask alongside a figure because while well, I'm waiting for the figure to harden enough to continue working on it, I can work on a mask at the same time. What I'll do is form out the main shape of the mask and then uh, let it start to dry. And as it starts to dry, it'll become easier to work with. Just knowing how to work with the clay as it's drying is the trick to making anything <laughs> out of clay, I think. When I was um, about 20, 21, I moved to Santa Clara, down in the village in one of my aunt's house. And then eventually I moved up where I am now. I was uh, living in an army tent with my two babies and I needed a place to live, so I started building this house. And I would make some sculptures, sell what I could, buy adobes and build the house little by little. It was roofed by a year's time, but then you slowly finish it bit by bit. So it's been about 19 years that I've been here. My family is a family of artists and very strong individuals. We laugh because it seems like Pueblo women, or at least Santa Clara Pueblo women, are very strong individuals. And my family has a lot of them. <laughs> my mother is Rena Swensel. I think of her as somebody who tried many things out in her life, but the main thing for her was trying to understand her culture. And so that was a really good perspective for me to have. She didn't just go, we're Indian. She wanted to know what that meant. My father's of German descent. He taught philosophy, and it was a very European-based mentality. So talk about extremes. <laughs> and then my mother grew up as a little poor Indian Pueblo woman, girl, and Somehow they got together. My father saw me as an artist, 
my mother sees me as a struggling person, I think, trying to make sense of it all. In the world my mother came from, being an artist doesn't really make sense because you just do what you do. And if you make art, you, you didn't call it art. You, they didn't sign their names to artwork. It just was. It just was. In my dad's world, you have Michelangelo and all the great artists of the world, and, and they're very well known. And so here comes these two very different perspectives clashing in me. <laughs> and uh, uh, on one hand, I loved how my father made it great and stand out. Like, I, you could become somebody, you know, somebody out in the world, a, a famous person. Uh, uh, and he liked to, uh, if I got fame or I got attention, he felt it. It was like, that's my daughter, you know. It was something he produced. My mother seemed to want it to be over soon. I was like, can we get this over with so we can go eat? And uh, so it, it, there's both those things. But I felt like my father definitely gave me encouragement that my mother didn't give but I'm glad for the balance of the two. It was the biggest showing of my work that I've ever had. The theme that ran through it wasn't specifically aimed for it being at Powaki. It was just what I had made in the last two years, accumulated all in one spot. So it was my life at that time. It was out of the context of galleries and so outside world. It was going back to the Pueblos. And a lot of the artists around here don't feel like they can just show their art right from home. They have to be established out in some gallery or have their name in some magazine or, you know, out there. But what if we went the other direction and made us important closer and closer to home? And so Powaki felt like I was sort of taking steps to cut closer to the center. And I knew because it's in Powaki and it's run by in the people in the area, that more people from the area were going to see it. It wasn't going to be tourists or art collectors, or those weren't going to be the main people. The main people coming through was the people on their way home from work to look at someone from home that they never get to see their work. I don't know how, my family's full of artists, and it's very rare I get to see their artwork because it's always off to New York, off to Scottsdale, off to wherever. And, and it'd be so nice to just see it here at home. So it was kind of my way of going, you guys want to see what I do? Come look at it. And, um, and, it, and it worked because I had all kinds of people that down the street or whatever, hey, I saw your show, it was good, or whatever they were commenting on it and it felt, felt good. I just want to show you something that's kind of interesting inside here. One of the things that um, Flowering Tree, the Institute, uh, is about is um, saving seeds. And one of the things we're interested here about doing is saving the seeds from this area, the native seeds, and found out by doing this that a lot of the old Pueblo seeds are quickly being lost. And if we don't keep growing them out, then they're lost forever. And it's just one more of these things that are getting lost. So like up here, we have it sectioned off, and here's the corn. These are from Hopi. These are from, these are old Anasazi ones. This is a Taos blue corn. Um, these are basically all the colors of corn um, came from um, corn that 
had all the colors in them, and then they just genetically engineered them out. So you've got just, you know, just whites, just blues, just reds, uh, things like that. And here's just more um, melons, and there are, there are some good stuff, like here's some Hopi watermelons. Um, we grow a lot of squashes around here, so I collect a lot of the native squashes. And of course, one reason to grow out these old seeds and stuff from here is because they're genetically um, made to uh, handle the environment here. And it's very dry, and we don't get much water here. And it also is a very short growing season because we're in the high desert. So you have to, here's Hopi lima beans. I like these guys. These are the best tasting beans I ever had. So it looks like nothing, but it's, this is the gold of the place. <laughs> I've been raising turkeys for maybe 20 years. I'm kind of known at this point for uh, having turkey feathers for ceremonies. They're native turkeys, meaning that they're the turkeys from the mountains in this area. They know me, and I go looking around. I don't pull the feathers out of them. I wait till they molt when they drop their feathers. So like I'll, I'll keep my eyes open for the feathers that we can use, like this one I can use. And I found one this morning that was a really nice um, lined one. And I just collect the feathers and keep them until um, we have a ceremony or dances. A couple years ago, the New Mexican Magazine did a book on me. As part of it, we did this etching, and they wanted it to be something about me, so it's an etching that shows images of my world. So I called it Roxy's World. And it shows my house, and the Pueblo, and the fields, and the mountains, and my studio, and um, us dancing, my gardens and animals. I come from a Pueblo perspective where the aim was to have balance. Balance between night and day, summer and winter, male and female. Everything has to be balanced by the opposite or else the universe goes out of whack. And then if that happens, you have bad things happen. The Pueblos understood the need for having a center place, a heart, a, a soul, or are being centered in yourself. And they have that gift to show to the world and say, this is what we need to be okay. We need to be centered. We need to be balanced in it. And how do you do that? You recreate that structure within yourself as an individual person. I've always been caught by people that are very careful with what they do. And that's just intrigued me since I was a little kid. Just someone who worked something really well. It could be a carpenter, a mechanic, a gardener, a bread maker. Just the way they're doing it is what captures me. Because in the manner that they're doing it, good things come from it because of the way they're doing it. And that is what I've aimed for. It's like. I want to be like that in whatever I do, whether it's making sculptures, whether it's raising kids, whether it's whatever it's I'm doing, I want to have that manner to me. Love what you're doing. When you love something, you do it like this. And if you can do everything with that manner, then it's going to be a good thing, whatever it is. The traditional types of Pueblo art or whatever become very patterned, symbolic. They're, even the figures are more symbolic of a person or an animal or clouds or whatever. They're symbols of those things. I feel like 
so much of the knowledge of those symbols is lost that in order to even know what those symbols mean again, I feel like people need to remember who they are. And then those symbols make sense again. They can't read those patterns as well anymore because they've lost touch with themselves. But if you're in touch with yourself, the symbols make sense. You can read it like a book. Like I see Rosie, for instance, when she's doing her songs or her dance and her drawings, and it's all about her story of now, and she connects it to the patterns of her culture, and she gets excited because sometimes she'll come to me and she says, I understand why they make this pattern, Mama. And I go, what do you mean? And I says, well, I was drawing this figure and she was dancing this way. And when she turned like this, all of a sudden that pattern showed up. And it's like, oh, I get it. It's the motion of people moving like this. And then she sees it in the trees and she sees it in the plants and the animals. And it just starts rolling into this bigger, bigger picture. And suddenly those patterns on our dresses or the old pottery things make sense. It's like. That's why they were making those patterns, because they were moving and expressing themselves like this. We have been here. We are the people of this place. We didn't come from somewhere else. There's that feeling. The feeling is we are from here. Even our, the way the village is set up, the architectural setting, is symbolic of we came out of the ground right right here. They'll point to the ground right where we came out of. That's like we're from this spot. And uh, there's something about that knowing that makes you be um, grounded. My figures first uh, had no sex to them. And they had no hair, they had no ears. And um, as time went on, they merged ears, and then now they have hair. Now you can tell the difference between them being male or female. So in a way, they're slowly emerging still. These figures with the um, small figures around it are my version of storytellers. This particular one not sure what I'm going to call her yet, but I'm doing this one for Swaya Indian Market. And I want it, it to have a theme of, uh, you know, here's all these Indian artists gathering for this big weekend with their, their wares, their artwork they've been working on. And to me, I always think of my artwork somewhat as babies, my babies. So this is sort of the theme of Indian Market to me. And um, she's going to have this pot on her head. And there, the babies are emerging out of the pot, which is symbolic for us. The pot is the earth. And we're all um, born of the earth. So she, her babies are coming out of the earth, but she's also symbolic of Mother Earth. And so the pot and her are the earth, and her babies are coming out. And she's going to market with her babies. And so um, it's kind of the emergent story alongside the art scene. I was struggling financially every year until I started doing the bronzes, they would get me through those hard times because the bronzes I could have make one piece and it's basically sold 10, 15 times over. I get a little piece of that and it spreads it out over the year. And it really helped financially for me to be more stable. And some people liked that they were bronze instead of clay because they're less breakable. And some of them look really good in bronze, that the bronze added a quality that I didn't realize would be there. And it has relieved an enormous amount of pressure from me to have to produce. I'm not a factory, so it helps. Yeah. It's made the originals 
be more valuable too, which isn't a bad thing. <laughs> and it gives me time to work on pieces longer. I don't have to try to get it done, trying to get it done all the time. I could take my time more and do less pieces and better pieces. years ago I was approached by the Smithsonian and asked to do a, a piece for their wall of the new theater building of the new National Indian Museum they're building in Washington DC. So I, I couldn't say yes, it just seemed a little bit overwhelming. I had to think, could I do this? Uh, where would I do this? I can't make it in my studio, it's not that big. Um, what would I make? They wanted me to represent um, indigenous peoples of the Americas, and what do I do? When I could think of indigenous peoples at first, I was like, I don't know all the tribes, first of all, and I don't know if I'm offending anyone, and I don't know if I, and it's like, just break it down, rocks, just get down to the very, very, very central core. And all of a sudden, I was back to the place of having a center and having it be in balance. And it has to be a balance between male and female and they're, they're spinning around this center. So they're all holding their hands in the center, making that center space and spinning out from that. And to me, that, that's everything. And, and what I like about it is it's the message, I believe indigenous peoples all over keep trying to say over and over again, but it's bigger than indigenous peoples. It's, goes out to every direction, in, all over, everyone. Um, so I call it um, Iwanini. I'm going to call the piece Iwanini, and that in Tewa means for life. This is for life, and it, life in all directions. It's for all of us. <laughs> 